Please turn in your Bibles once again to the book of Ephesians, and Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 10, and this is on page 979 after you're using the Pew Bibles this morning. Paul writes as the Holy Spirit leads and directs him, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you for all the things that we've been singing about this morning. There's so much to be thankful for. We thank you that you have saved us, and part of that salvation includes that you have freed us from the devil's uh, power in our lives, and we've been transferred from his dominion into the kingdom of your beloved son. We thank you, Father, for those things. We thank you for giving information to us, truth to us, about a realm that we cannot see. Uh, But because your truth tells us this, we believe it. We know it's true that there is this unseen spiritual realm. We also thank you that you have given us uh, armor and strength to fight as we are engaged in warfare in that realm and with that realm. Uh, This morning, as we look to your word, help us to understand it, help us to appreciate the the gifts that you've granted us, the power through your Son that's uh, available to be appropriated for us as your children, the armor to put on that's available for us as your children to put on, uh, but also the danger that's out there as well. Help us to have that balance of knowing the resources are there and we're totally fine if we take advantage of them, but also the danger that lurks when we don't do so. So uh, this morning, help us to understand these things and look at spiritual warfare in this way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my most memorable classes in college was called U.S. Military History Since 1917. That may or may not sound interesting to you. It was very interesting in college. My best college professor taught that class, Mr. Meslowski. And uh, maybe some of you in this room had him at some point at UNL. A really good teacher. One of the books we read for the class was about a World War II rifle company called The Men of Company K. And uh, this book was based on the reminiscences of these men who came over to Europe, Company K, in November of 1944, and they fought in the front lines as uh, Germany was more and more a defeated foe. Yeah, they fought in the lines, including in the Battle of the Bulge. They had incredible stories of hardship and courage and perseverance in the face of a powerful, determined foe. But uh, aside from all that, which is what you'd think you'd find in a book like this, one other thing has kind of stuck with me through all the years, about 30 years ago when I read this book, uh, they sometimes would be very frustrated as they received different orders from the the higher-ups. Things like this. Take Hill 7 today. Advance across this field. Hold it. Don't advance till Friday. Uh, Well, why would that be frustrating? They didn't see any meaning. Well, why Hill 7 and not Hill 8? And why, if we can keep on going, are we just holding this until Friday, and then on Friday we move on? In other words, they knew their commands, but they didn't see how the command, and they were very effective in doing it, and very faithful and courageous in doing it. But they didn't, they didn't, they weren't told, or they didn't see or understand the big picture. Well, what's the big deal with Hill 7? And why not just keep going if we can keep going? So what? First, remember this, right here in America in 2023, you are in the heat of the battle. Not against the Chinese, not against terrorists, 
I'm not even talking about a culture war. Christian, you're a soldier of Christ, and whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you want to be in it or not, you are in the midst of a spiritual battle. You are in the midst of a spiritual war. Uh, I'll never forget, as a fairly new believer, uh, when Bible scholar John Whitcomb came and did a Bible conference at uh, Indian Hills. I was going to Indian Hills at the time here in Lincoln, and John Whit- Whitcomb came and did this Bible conference there. Afterwards, a friend and, and, and I, who felt called of God to the ministry, spoke with John Whitcomb about per- perhaps looking into pastoral ministry and training. And he got our names and some information about us and things like that. And then he said something like this, Gentlemen, watch out. From this day forward, you've got a big red bullseye on your back. You're on Satan's hit list. That was sobering to hear. I'll tell you what, that's not true just of pastors. The moment you became a Christian, you changed sides. Your life may have been one way. In, in some instances, your life might be almost uh, simpler or less problems before you get saved than after. Because the moment you became a Christian, you did change size. You were transferred from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of God's beloved Son, Jesus Christ. And you joined up with a holy rebellion against the God of this world, Satan. John says this in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. He says, We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So if you're a Christian, if you've been saved, if you've been born again, you're, in a sense, behind enemy lines, and you're in this holy rebellion against the evil one. We're not under his power anymore, but... I take it each one of us has a big bullseye on our back because he hates our guts. Really, he hates everyone. He's a liar and a murderer from the beginning, Jesus says. But Peter's words to believers, he tells us this, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. What's the point? Uh, I told this story about the men of Company K a moment ago, how they'd sometimes experience frustration and not knowing the big picture of why they're being told to do what they were told to do. Why this hill? Why hold it? Why not keep advancing? I think the same thing can sometimes happen to us as we see different commands in Scripture. In other words, here we are in Ephesians 6, verse 10 and 11. Why be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might and put on the whole armor of God? Okay, we're called to do it, but why? Our king, Jesus, he's given us not only clear marching orders, but also the big picture. He's brought out through his servant Paul why we're commanded to do what we're commanded to do here in Ephesians 6, verses 10 and following. Why these commands are essential for each one of us. He he tells us what's the big picture of our warfare as believers. Last week we began looking at two commands our King Jesus gives to us through the Apostle Paul here in Ephesians chapter 6. First command is, uh, be strong in the Lord. If you weren't here last Sunday, I encourage you to go back and check it out online because... I think there's some very important, practical, biblical instruction on how to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And really, I take it doing what Jesus, through the Apostle Paul, commands us in verse 11, the second command, that that is dependent on us living out the first command here, be strong in the Lord. So it's very essential. Last week we saw that some means that God has given us to be strong in him is by prayer from Ephesians 3 verses 16 and 17 through faith, uh, the verses listed there on the screen, and by grace. Uh, Again, we went over this extensively last week. I I think it's very important and very helpful. 
But these are the God-given means for us to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Uh, The way Paul lays this out here in verses 10 and 11, and these two different commands that we're looking at here is, verse 10, it's God's side, be strong in the Lord. In other words, let God strengthen you. This is a passive verb. You're, You're not the one who's trying to be really strong in and of yourself. But it's in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Verse 11, now, based upon his strengthening and based upon his might and based upon his working in your life, now you, and here it's active voice, you do this, put on the whole armor of God. And that's the second command. Put on the whole armor of God. So Paul's not talking about letting go and letting God here. We are called actively to put on this armor, realizing that it's God's strength and God's might that enables us to do it. And it's even his armor that we are called to have on. Uh, I I take it this is the same theological perspective as we see elsewhere in Scripture, but probably most distinctly, most clearly in Philippians chapter 2, end of verse 2. 12 and start of verse 13 when Paul says, uh, Work out your own salvation. In other words, you've been saved by grace through faith, but now work this out in your newly changed life. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And we could respond to that something like, Well, Paul, you know that Jesus said, Apart from me, you can do nothing. Don't you know I can't do this? And then in verse 13, Paul explains himself. For, you do this, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In other words, Paul's telling them, do this, work out your salvation, based upon the fact that God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So with these two different commands here in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, and in verse 11, I seek the Lord's strengthening. I go to him in prayer. I trust in him and his promises and his goodness. I seek to rely on his grace to strengthen me in the ways he's revealed that he does. But then I act. I do. Whether I feel strong or not, whether I feel empowered or not, I've asked God for his strengthening. I've prayed about it. I've sought his means. I trust that he'll answer his prayer in light of his promises. And therefore, I'm going to set out trying to do it. I'm going to set out trying to put on the whole armor of God. Again here, the action is in the second command. This is active. This is what we do. All that to say, the second command that Paul gives here in Ephesians 6, so that we can stand firm in the midst of anything that the evil one throws at us, shows that we are very actively involved in the battle as well. We put on this armor realizing that it's only as a result of God's strengthening and his might that we're able to do it. Look down in your Bibles to the second command here, Ephesians 6 verse 11. We saw the first command last week in verse 10. The second command here is Ephesians 6 verse 11. Uh, Paul writes, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The the phrase Paul uses here, the whole armor of God, comes from one Greek word, panoplion. And uh, let's see, I I should look over to this side of the auditorium. Either Phil or Larry, what hymn uses that word panoply or panoplion? That might be, that's, that's a sudden question. I'll, I'll let you ponder that. I don't know. There is some hymn that as we sing it, it talks about something about the panoply of God. Well, that's where it comes from. It's the whole armor of God. When you see that phrase, that's what it means. In verses 14 through 17, we're not going to get into that this morning, as you probably guessed. But when we get there, we're going to look at each piece of the whole armor of God in detail. For now, just note that the whole armor of God involves truth, righteousness, readiness that's related to the gospel, faith, salvation, the word of God, and prayer. Here where Paul commands, 
put on the whole armor of God, we need to note, we don't just pick and choose. You know, I really like the helmet of salvation. But the word of God, uh, that's not for me. Or the breastplate of righteousness, that sounds exciting. I'll, I'll work on that one. I'll try to put that one on. But having my sheet sh- feet shod with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, yeah, that sounds boring. That doesn't sound important. No, Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. Whatever I list here, this is part of that armor of God. All of it. It's all needed. Put it all on. We're going to see more of this uh, here in a moment this morning and some more even next week. But our foe, our adversary, the devil, he's more powerful, he's more resourceful, he's smarter, he's older than any of us. And he knows our weak spots. He, he probably knows our weak spots better than we know it ourselves. So we need to cover every part of ourselves by putting on the full armor of God. All of it. A few moments ago, I again used this illustration about the, the men of Company K. And I said, okay, we're going to see more of a big picture here. Uh, Jesus, through the Apostle Paul, is going to answer that question of why Why do we follow these commands like we do? Why be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might and put on the whole armor of God? Uh, We're going to see three reasons in this passage we must follow the commands here from King Jesus through Paul. His commands are necessary in the midst of spiritual warfare. Here's what we're going to see. First, because our enemies our enemy, and we'll see in verse 12, there are enemies, but verse 11, enemy, because our enemy has schemes to destroy us. Second, because our enemies are unseen spiritual forces far stronger than we are. Third, because our enemies have devastating surprise attacks. Uh, It's verse 13. Today our focus is just going to be on the first of these reasons and we'll slightly get into the second at the end of our time this morning. But first, this this is why, this is the big picture. This is why we put on the whole armor of God. This is why we are called to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Look down to verse 11 again. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Devil is our enemy. The devil is our adversary. A couple weeks ago, we saw his goal. His goal is to, if, if it's a believer, his goal is to destroy someone's faith. His goal is that their faith would fail. His goal for everyone is to see them to go to hell. That's his goal. He, again, he's a liar and he's a murderer from the beginning. We know for believers that he'll fail when it comes to those who've already been saved. Because our King Jesus promises, I give them, he's talking about my sheep, these are his people, these are uh, uh, his sheep, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one, not even the evil one, not even the the adversary, not Satan, not even yourself, (coughs) no one will snatch them out of my hand. So whatever the devil's goal is, our Savior has the promise that we trust in. No one will snatch them out of my hand. So for us who've been saved, the enemy's goal, that is his goal, but he'll always fail when when it comes to us, his sheep. But our enemy is still a powerful and ancient foe. And since his fall, he's been always about seeking to destroy and keep people from God and his salvation. Uh, in this verse, our, our command put on the whole armor of God, the why is because of the schemes of the devil. I, I take it, uh, even if we didn't spend time on his schemes and know them at all, the armor of God and being strong in the Lord and the strength of his might is sufficient. But I take it, when we have the rest of Scripture... And when Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. It's a different word. It's not the same word for schemes. 
But when, when he says we're not ignorant of these things, I take it in Scripture we can see what his schemes are like, and it's fitting, and it's helpful for us to spend some time at least thinking of what the schemes of the devil are. Uh, here's a football illustration I probably shouldn't, shouldn't say, but uh, lately the Michigan coach and team has been accused of stealing signs from the teams that they play against. Because if you know what the other people are going to do, that makes it easier for you to defend them and, and offensively go against them. So, yeah, we have the full armor of God, and we can put on the, the Lord and the strength of his might. That's sufficient. But, boy, it's nice when we also know the enemy's playbook. And Scripture gives us a lot of schemes of the devil. So, again, I, I take it as just another helpful thing, and that's what we're going to spend some time on here at this time. First and most basically, it, it's even something that the Bible just calls our enemy. It, it just calls... Satan, the devil, the tempter. This is his most basic scheme, and probably if you have been Christian at all, this is what you'd think about when you think of the devil. He, he's, his schemes involve temptation to do the wrong. Turn back to the book of Matthew. Turn back to the book of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 4. This is page 809 in the Pew Bibles. Matthew 4, verse 1. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then verse 3. And the tempter. This, this is just his name. This is just who he is. This is his character. This is what he's about. Uh, he's the tempter. The tempter came to him and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. So he's, his main scheme, the main scheme of the devil is temptation. First scheme we're going to see here, or we do see here, is uh, he attacks the goodness of God's plan. Where do we get that from? Uh, I take it when Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, I, I take it it was to be tempted, it says that, but also he, I, I take it he was uh, called, this was his command, this was God's plan for him at this time, to fast. And I take it until God said, you're done. He was to keep the fast going. So there's this temptation by saying, you know what, you could get out of this. If you're the son of God, you could just command the stones to turn to bread. Now, that's not something he could ever command you or I to do. We couldn't do that. But for Jesus, he is the son of God, and he could do that. So it was a real temptation. But to get out of what God was calling him to do, to continue the fast, hey, just make bread out of these stones. Matthew 4, verse 4. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Here's another temptation, verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. In other words, Jesus, you just told me it is written in response to this temptation. I'll tell you something that's written. Here's something that's written also. Now you go do this and show your power this way. Uh, here we see that he tempts by twisting the scripture. And, and, and this idea of temptation, this, this way that Satan tempts goes all the way back the Garden of Eden in the first temptation uh, of mankind ever, where Satan told Eve, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? 
This is just his method. This is his scheme. This is what he does. He tries to confuse the issue. He changes either the intent of a passage or the meaning of Scripture by changing a word or two. And if you recall, how he changes uh, in Genesis 3, verse 1, how he changes things, totally changes around what God actually told Eve to make it sound like very forbidding. Uh, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? God didn't say that. That makes it sound like you can't eat of anything. God said, you can eat of every tree of the garden, just not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So this is what Satan does. He changes the wording a little bit. He changes the meaning. He tries to limit things. He twists scripture. That's part of his scheme of temptation. Verse 7. Jesus said to him again, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Verse 8, third temptation. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. Remember we said earlier that he's the God of this world and here that, that's why he can tempt Jesus in this way. And he said to him, Jesus, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Sometimes Satan just directly contradicts God's will and offers what apparently is an easier path or something that might seem better for us than God's plan. Uh, Here, I I take it an underlying aspect of this temptation is, you know, Jesus, you could bypass the cross, you could bypass all these other things by which you will become king, and I can just give it all to you. Just bow down to me. Again, this is similar to what Satan did in the garden, and I think there's similarities between Genesis 3 and how Satan tempted Jesus in Matthew 4. But uh, Genesis 3, here's this direct onslaught. This is probably what we most often think about Satan and how he tempts. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God said you would. Satan says you won't. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This is probably, again, when we normally think of temptation, this is probably what we think of would happen. This is a direct challenge. God says this, I say this. Who will you believe? God says don't do this, I say do it because it's better. Verse 10 of Matthew 4. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Later in Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to see one of the elements of our armor is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I take it here in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus shows us how to use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, when he keeps saying, he he doesn't argue with Satan, he doesn't debate Satan, he just keeps saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. End of the argument. So, that's what we most often think of the schemes of the devil. He's a tempter, that's why he tempts. Now, unlike Jesus, where Satan was tempting him directly and to his face, and they had a conversation like this, usually, for us, I take it his temptation comes from implanting ideas or thoughts into our minds. For instance, with Judas, it says of Judas, John 13, verse 2, during supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, So it was a thought, it was an idea that the devil as the tempter was tempting Judas to do this. He he put this into his heart earlier, and now here at the Last Supper he's going to do it. Uh, As we talk about spiritual warfare, sometimes we might be uncertain. Is it my own fleshly desires that are pulling me the wrong way? Is it the world system, maybe through a video or through a song or just ideas that are out in society that are common? Is that pulling me away from God? Is that tempting me in this way? Is it the devil and demonic hordes tempting me in this way? Uh, 
I take it the whole armor of God, whatever the source is, whether it's the world, the flesh, or the devil, the whole armor of God is sufficient to repel any of those attacks. So that's most obvious. He's the tempter. He tempts. I think we're aware of that. Another of his schemes, though, which we saw earlier from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, but here we see it probably even more directly, he seeks persecution to cause Christians to deny Christ. Remember, that's his goal. That's what he wants to see happen, cause Christians to deny Christ. Revelation 2, verse 10 brings this out. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So persecution. Sometimes that's one of his means, that's one of his schemes, just blatantly uh, persecuting Christians. Another of his schemes, which is sobering, involves using other people to cause us to go against God's way. Using other people to accomplish his goals. For instance, uh, Matthew 16, verses 21 through 23. If you're still in the book of Matthew, why don't you turn over there. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Does that seem good and loving by Peter? I, I think, I mean, initially it seems that way. Well, I, I don't want this to happen to you. Never! Not even, I don't want it. Never! And it's never good when you rebuke the one that you have just confessed is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's never a good move to rebuke him, which Peter does here. <clears throat> but what was one of Satan's original temptations to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4? You could have every kingdom of the world. You could rule the world if you would just bow down to me. In other words, you could have all this without the cross, without the sacrifice. I take it here, Peter is unwittingly being used as a pawn of Satan to tempt Jesus to turn away from his mission to seek and save the lost, to offer his life as a ransom for many. Verse 23, this is why Jesus says what he says. Matthew 16, verse 23. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. That, that's sobering. Good intentions, I think Peter had, but again, never rebuke the one that you just confessed is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's not, that's not good. But never, this shall never happen to you. But uh, think of Job. Uh, in Job 1.8, this isn't on the screen. It says, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. Remember that. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So Satan's challenge, Satan's goal, uh, you, you talk about Job as this righteous man, this blameless man, there's no one like him all the earth. Let me tell you, if you take your hedge away from him, your hedge of protection, he will curse you to your face. That's what Satan wanted to see happen. Do you remember after Job faced this and other incredible trials and suffering when God did allow 
Satan to even stretch out against Job himself, his hand. Do you remember what his wife said? And his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Job's wife was unwittingly egging Job on to do what Satan wanted him to do, to curse God. Satan's schemes involve using other people to accomplish his goals. This should make you pause and really be determined to put on the whole armor of God. Why? Do you realize that there may have been or will be times in your life when you are unwittingly being used by Satan to accomplish his goals in someone else's life. That's a horrible thought. It's a horrible thought. But we see it from Peter, who was a believer. I don't know about Job's wife. I think probably so. The last scheme of our enemy's schemes we'll look at this morning is using false teachers to lead people away from the truth. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it says this. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. What's their awful false teaching? Verse 3. Who forbid marriage. Boy, that seems more holy. That, that's how temptations work. God says it's good. They forbid marriage. And require abstinence from foods. Well, that seems more holy that you're abstaining from foods. No. God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Teachings of demons. But these teachings come through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared people. Yes. I don't know how uh, seriously you take the danger of false teaching. But here we see this is something Satan and his hordes used to accomplish their goal of getting people to depart from the faith. False teaching is a big deal. Uh, there are people who are claiming to receive today, and I suppose throughout history, uh, teaching through spirit guides or ascended masters. When, when we see a verse like 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 says, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits. And to teachings of demons, if someone's saying, you know, a higher master was telling me in a vision or a dream or in this other realm to do this, as soon as you hear that phrase, this ascended master, this higher spirit, this spirit master, if someone's talking about that, flee from these kind of people. The reality is that they are conveying doctrines of demons. And their goal is to get you to depart from the faith. And if you look, and I wouldn't recommend doing this, but if you ever look into kind of the New Age stuff and people who get teachings from spirit guides, inevitably, always, there's a message that goes contrary to the biblical message of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. So, the enemy's schemes involve temptation, persecution and suffering. I, I add this here because uh, it, it's kind of on the same track as persecution, suffering is. We see this used in Job verses chapters 1 and 2. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, maybe this afternoon go look at Job chapters 1 and 2. Suffering is one of his means. Not all suffering is from the devil, but at least in Job 1 and 2 we see that there it is. He had to get God's permission to do it but it was his work in trying to get people, get Job to curse God and die. But Job, we know, just kept clinging to God, kept uh, holding on. He, he questioned things. Uh, 
Ultimately, he endured in his faith through all that the enemy threw at him. Using other people to accomplish his goals, very similar would be using false teachers to lead people away from the truth. When we have on the whole armor of God, we're protected from all these schemes. The enemy might use them on us, but if we have on God's armor, it will remain standing in the midst of his attack. We're looking at three reasons the commands of Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 13 are, are there, and why they're essential to stand firm in spiritual warfare. We saw the first reason, because our enemy has schemes to destroy us. The second reason, which we won't get into except for barely just saying it this morning, because our enemies are unseen spiritual forces far stronger than us. If you're not back in Ephesians, turn back there quickly as we close with this. Ephesians 6, verse 12. <clears throat> Ephesians 6, verse 12, page 979 in your pew Bibles. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. One thing I'll just bring out here this morning, and then Lord willing, we'll come back next Sunday and start up here in verse 12 again. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers. That phrase, we do not wrestle. What is this picture? The warfare we're engaged in is, ultimately, it's like hand-to-hand -hand combat. If there's one thing about wrestling, you can't just kind of, you know, in baseball, you can be far away from your competitor, and they hit the ball, and you catch it, and you might throw them out. In wrestling, you, are, you, you have to be involved directly with that person. Paul is saying this is what spiritual warfare is like. And it's not against flesh and blood, ultimately, but against these forces. That, that in one sense should be frightening because they're far more powerful than we are. But in another sense, that's why we must be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And that's why we must use his full armor, the whole armor of God. And... We'll come back further to this next Sunday morning, Lord willing. And just want to close with this uh, sobering reminder of kind of a sobering subject, but uh, John writes in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. What this is getting at is if as a practice, if as a characteristic, that someone who, who even professes faith in Christ, if they just go on unrepentedly sinning as they did before they say that God saved them, uh, that, that can't be, John is saying here. If someone is born again, this will make a difference in someone's life. It will make a difference in someone's character. Verse 10, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Number one, I, I don't want to shake anyone's faith that has been saved because assurance is a great blessing of God. Uh, it's a gift. It, it's a blessing. It's an encouragement. Uh, I don't want to shake anyone's faith. Secondly, from this passage, we see John say, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. I take it by what he says here and throughout the book, it's a fair question to ask yourself as you examine yourself to see whether your faith is real and saving faith. Do I, as a characteristic pattern, not sinlessly, not perfectly, but as, as the direction of my life, do I practice righteousness or not? Do I love my brother or not? Is my heart's desire to follow Jesus and his righteous will, 
or am I just living for my sin? Uh, John says that that makes it evident where you're at. And if you answer those questions when I said, or not, or not, or not, and you, all those or nots, if you're saying, I do, I do, I do, that's bad news. Uh, that would indicate, possibly, that you're still a child of the devil. Here's the good news. In Acts chapter 26, Paul shares his testimony how God saved him, Jesus saved him, on the road to this Damascus and gave him his commission to, to preach and share the gospel. And uh, in verse 15, it says, which this is not on the screen, I said, Paul's saying this, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Verse 16, Jesus says this then, But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. Paul would be a witness. Paul would declare who Jesus is, that he's the Christ, the Son of the living God. He would declare what Jesus did to save people. He died on the cross to take your sins, and he rose again from the dead. That's all good news. But that good news demands a response. Verse 17. Delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, Verse 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Good news is there's full and complete forgiveness for you. That's good news. Christ died for your sins. That's why there can be forgiveness and you receive this gift by God's grace and by turning from darkness to light. That's repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Faith that he is the Christ. Faith that he is the Son of God. All that God is, Jesus Christ is. Faith that he did die on the cross for your sins and my sins. Faith that he did rise from the dead. And it's because of what he did on the cross that you can be forgiven. You rely on that. If you're here this morning, ask yourself, have I ever done that? Have I ever uh, turned from darkness to light? Have I ever put my faith in Jesus Christ? If you haven't, today's the day. Because there's still this promise, this promise of forgiveness, and it's full and complete, and you can be taken out of the enemy's camp and no longer be a child of the devil, but a child of God. Receive this gift, and it is a gift, by grace, through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word and all that you've done for us. We are undeserving of any good, your word brings out that we've all sinned and fallen short of your glory. We've all deserved separation from you and, and hell. But you and your grace and your love for us sent your son Jesus into this world to die for us, to save us, to destroy the works of the devil, to rescue us from what we deserved. Thank you, Father, that as your children here in this room, we... We have full and complete forgiveness. We have a powerful King Jesus who says, no one will snatch you out of my hand. We rely on that promise. Thank you, Father, that you've also given us commands to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Help us to do so. You've given us command to put on the whole armor of God. Help us to do so. We've seen the schemes of the devil this morning. Help us to think about things as they're happening and not uh, easily fall for his schemes. But again, resist by having on the full armor of God. And if there's anyone here today who's never yet been saved or even right at the moment is contemplating, uh, am I a child of God or a child of the devil? Do I want to turn from darkness to light? Oh, Father, convict them through your Holy Spirit. Draw them into a relationship with yourself. Enable them to repent and believe 
in your Son, Jesus Christ, and be saved and forgiven and granted eternal life and a new relationship with you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.